Yeah. All right. So hello, <clears throat> good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to the session on uh, blending physical and virtual, shaping the new workplace. Uh, my name is Mario Mariniello. I'm senior fellow at Bruegel uh, for the future of work, and I will have the honor uh, to moderate the ensued discussion. Um, as you probably know by now, you can interact with the panel uh, by connecting to Slido and using the code BAM21WORK. So you can ask your questions there. We also have a poll question for you. Uh, so let me shoot it uh, to you right away. And the question is, imagine the pandemic is over and there is no COVID-19 risk indoor anymore. Would you like to keep working uh, uh, remotely if you could? As you can see, you have uh, five uh, options here, ranging from being back to office full time to a few days uh, only uh, at the office or even to switch completely to uh, full remote. Eh? So please uh, pick your, vo uh, your choice and we will look at the results in the course of the panel. Now, let me give uh, a little bit of context and, uh, and briefly introduce uh, the discussion. We often tend to assume that the place where we are, the dynamics we experience every day, the structures that condition our lives are somehow given. Eh? Uh, they are, by default, the only possible ones. Eh? We tend to move by inertia. So sometimes we need major shocks uh, to open our eyes and, and give us the occasion to rethink those structures and see beyond uh, our veil of ignorance to discover uh, uh, that what we thought uh, we could not do is actually possible. Uh, so in this current case, we had two idiosyncratic factors playing out. Uh, one is the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and the other one is the ongoing uh, technological revolution. Uh, with all its tragic burden, uh, of course, the, the pandemic was also a great experiment uh, that allowed us to challenge what we thought uh, should be the norm. Before the pandemic, 85% of European workers had never teleworked in their life, and many of them didn't know that they could and now would like to retain at least a little bit of the flexibility that they experienced in the future. On the other hand, many employers thought that working from home would uh, impact productivity. But in fact, uh, during the pandemic, uh, that did not happen. So the question is, what have we learned from this mass experiment and what will happen next? This is a very relevant question from a number of dimensions, including the broad societal ones, because, for example, remote work has the potential to exacerbate inequality. We have seen it uh, clearly during the pandemic. When the crisis hit hard, half of workers with top earnings could switch to telework, uh, compared to just 29% uh, of low-paid uh, workers. So it is reasonable to expect that telework will have some redistributive effects, both at micro level and macro level. At micro level, for example, younger workers may find it hard to make a career or there may be uh, gender discrimination, for example, because women tend to uh, be more exposed to so-called Zoom fatigue. At macro level, teleworking may have profound implications on cities, on the peripheries, on local economies, on the service sector, and so forth. So all in all, this suggests that the shift to the new paradigm will require adjustments. Eh? We cannot just jump uh, from uh, one dogma to the other and hope for the best. And there might be also scope for policy intervention uh, if we see that uh, labor markets fail to self-adjust and address the arising issues. And just for the sake of discussion, let me point out that here in Europe, we have a so-called telework framework agreement, which dates back to 2002, eh, after the pandemic and 20 years of technological development. It seems rather time for, for an update. So to discuss all these uh, exciting topics, today we have, a, a, I believe, a great panel, of course in hybrid form, uh, it couldn't be otherwise. So connected from the US, we have Nick uh, Bloom, uh, professor of economics uh, at Stanford uh, University. Nick uh, has done a lot of research on telework during the pandemic and has become an important reference for the academic community on, on this topic. Uh, also connecting uh, from the US is Mike Froman, who is vice chairman and president of strategic uh, growth at MasterCard. Um, he, he is also a former member of President Obama cabinet as trade representative between 2013 and uh, 2017. Uh, hello to both of you. Uh, and also connecting from Europe, we have Luca Vicentini, uh, who is generally 
uh, sorry, who is General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, which is the uh, major trade union organization representing workers at European level. Uh, Luca has been uh, General Secretary since 2015, but has more than 20 years of experience representing workers' uh, instances at national and European level. And finally, in flesh and bones, uh, next to me, thank you uh, for not leaving me alone on the stage, uh, Sarah Mathieu, who is a member of the European Union Parliament uh, for the Greens, uh, European Free Alliance. Sarah has a long experience in politics at local, national, and European level, and she was also very much involved in the discussion around the right to disconnect that took place at the European uh, Parliament. So I think we are very well equipped to tackle the many questions uh, that are out there on the future of the workplace. Uh, so now, just before kicking off uh, with Nick, uh, maybe can we have a quick look at the, at the poll and see how uh, the audience uh, and, I mean, like it confirms uh, the, the feeling that uh, most of the people with 55% of our audience saying that they would like to come back uh, to work, uh, but just, um, uh, like, actually split in between. In between uh, half of the week uh, uh, working remotely and half of the week uh, instead uh, working from the office. Uh, Nick, does this uh, square well with uh, what you found in your research? You want to take the floor? Yes, it does. <laughs> you guys are pretty moderate. So why don't I take the floor and uh, I'll go through it. This, it fits very well indeed, so thanks very much. So um, I'm just going to talk for like 10 minutes uh, and give you some uh, basic facts and then uh, hand back. So I've been working on working from home for almost 20 years. Seems like Michael and I had some connection with the Obama cabinet. I uh, you know, I, I've been doing policy on this and talking to various execs for a long time. So I'm going to talk to you mainly today about post-pandemic or during the pandemic working from home based on two large surveys I've been running for the last year and a half. So firstly, where are we? So what are some of the figures? This is US data. I have some UK data looks very similar. Uh, Northern Europe looks reasonably similar, slightly lower levels. So in the US, um, what we see is pre-pandemic, only about 5% of Full working days were worked from home. Full days are important because that's you know, what impacts commuting and office space. So I know a lot of people tend to work from home in the mornings and the evenings, but the, you know, the policy and managerial debate is really focused on the full day. So before COVID, it was pretty rare, only 5% of days. During the pandemic, it's gone up and down with each wave and each lockdown. But basically around 50% of people are working from home. And Mario, that links very much to what you mentioned earlier on, which is, in the US, uh, as with Northern Europe, about half of jobs, basically managers, professionals, probably everyone listening, can work from home and has been pretty much full-time throughout the pandemic, including now. The other half of people can't basically work from home now. <laughs> Frontline retail, manufacturing, healthcare, teaching, it's kind of hard to do that remotely. So that's what gets you roughly 50% of working days right now. If we look out ahead, based on our survey of 5,000 people a month and 1,000 firms, we hear pretty robustly, most as in 90% of organizations in the US are going to hybrid, which means, you know, based on your poll, everyone will be very happy. They're offering uh, those that can work remotely, so the kind of manager or professional half of us, the option to come into the office three days a week and work from home two days a week. So as an example, Apple, Apple announced a few months ago that they're going to have everyone come in on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, work from home Wednesday and Friday. So hybrid has become totally dominant. And so what we're going to see post-pandemic is half of us will probably work hybrid. We'll come in three days a week, work from home two days a week. The other half will stay home. And that's why, as an economy, roughly quarter of working days post-COVID are going to be at home, three quarters uh, in the office. So why has hybrid become so dominant? Uh, you know... I talked to, I probably talked to about 200 firms since the beginning, organizations, hospitals, I talked to a local city council, talking to the UN, the World Bank, you know, a large number of organizations, and hybrid has become totally dominant. Why has it become dominant? Well, hybrid, as in three days, say, in the office to at home, balances off two, two main benefits. So on the one side, one benefit is working in the office, it appears to be better for creativity, better for maintaining culture. So 
There's lots of stories. The research evidence on this is a little bit weaker. I can talk about it if people are interested. But basically, whenever I talk to, you know, execs, they say, we really want people in the office to be creative, new ideas, come in, kind of relax conversation and kick off meetings, maybe over lunch, over coffee. We want people to connect with their coworkers, and you need some face-to-face -face time. Working from home, on the other hand, has a couple of upsides. One is it's quiet. So I hear so many stories about noise uh, in the office. You know, my favorite was the person that complained. The person at the desk next to them was clipping their toenails uh, under the table with this huge toenail clipper and said it was disgusting. It was really distracting. You know, it's people shouting and arguing and crying in the office, et cetera. And secondly, it saves on the commute. So the average employee commutes about half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening. So if you work from home, you save that. So most companies under hybrid are saying, look, take Apple. We're going to have you come in Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. All our meetings, all our social events, training events, client presentations are going to be on those three days. They'll be exhaustingly social. You know, you're going to be so tired of talking to people by the end of the day. And then on the Wednesday and Friday, you're going to have your quiet time. You go home, you do your reading, your you know, writing, data analysis, emails, maybe one-on-one -on -one meetings, which work well on Zoom, but you don't do any big events. So... You know, the, the question that I'm facing, I'm going to, you know, turn this to a more managerial rather than economics issue. The question I face, I, you know, probably once or twice a day from organizations is how to manage hybrid. In, the, you know, the US, UK, most firms have got to the view they're going to do hybrid. That's kind of yesterday's decision. The question is, how do you make it work? And much like the poll you showed, here's a poll that's now po um, accumulated over around 30,000 Americans where we asked how many times post-COVID would you like to come to work? And you, know, you notice there's a big spread. So I noticed from the Bruegel poll that, you know, there were some people that said rarely or never. There are some that said they want to come into work every day. And then there's a mix in between. So the problem is how to deal with this. And, you know, a lot of managers, particularly early on in the pandemic, so I'd say last year, would say things like, I remember a very senior uh, exec uh, tech firm in the C-suite and a, a firm you all know, she said, look, um, I treat my employees like adults. You know, this is a free country. If they get their job done, if they're productive, they can work from home. I don't care what they do. I don't care. They're sitting at home listening to Spotify in shorts in the garden. They can choose what they do as long as they meet their targets. And early on, that was a very popular view. Uh, I've become concerned, and there's a lot of stuff in the media, and I've talked to companies a lot with this choice, uh, and the three concerns are this. One is mixed mode. So mixed mode is the setup whereby some people are at home, some are uh, uh, in the office. And you kind of have it right now, in fact, with, with the current conference. Now, that's very hard for meetings because you get a sense of folks at home are feeling left out. So imagine three are at home, three in the office. The three people in the office, maybe to be good, join the call from their own laptops. They go into, you know, Zoom little cubicles, soundproof cubicles to take the call at the office, which you know, highlights this is an important thing to build these cubicles. The problem is if it's a difficult meeting, after the meeting ends, people close the laptops in the office, they stand up, they leave the cubicle and they kind of carry on the meeting. So there's a lot of complaints about mixed mode. It doesn't work very well. It looks great in stock photos. These are from Logitech and Google, but in practice, it's problematic. Second issue is inefficient use of office space. Turns out nobody wants to work from home on Wednesday. Everyone wants to work from home on Monday and Friday. So if you let people choose, you don't use your office space very well. Third issue is maybe the least obvious, but Mary, you mentioned this earlier, you kind of inferred it, which is impact on diversity. So in our survey data on the left, it turns out who wants to work from home and how many days is not random. So if you look amongst college graduates, so people with a university degree, uh, who have children under the age of 12, so that's around 35 40% of the workforce, you see that in that group, women report significantly wanting to work from home more days than men. On the bottom, if you look by ethnic background, you see Black and Asian Americans report more days they want to work from home than white Americans we see a much higher preference amongst the disabled, amongst people that live far from the office. So this all makes complete sense. And, you, know, I, I, you know, it's very easy to understand why this is. The problem is this co collides with fact B, which is if you are working from home 
and other people in your team that you're competing for promotions with they're coming in the office every day, you're going to be at a disadvantage. And in fact, in a research study I did 10 years ago on working from home where we randomized people, we did an A-B test. We found folks that were randomized into working from home had almost 50% lower promotion 21 months later. So you can see if you let people choose, there's a real fear. Five years down the down the line, maybe single young men living next door to the office come in every day and get promoted. So finally, I end off. Something is kind of you know interesting, maybe not surprising, is that here's the handshakes are out. So I looked up the handshake, and the handshake apparently goes back thousands of years. So the Assyrians, when they met the Babylonians for some peace treaty, were all shaking hands. So this is you know thousands of years old. Turns out COVID looks like at least temporarily it's kicking it out. So if you look on here, we say what did how do people greet each other pre-COVID? Both men and women primarily shook hands, about two-thirds in both groups. Post-COVID, what do people want to do? You notice for both genders that non-touch verbal greetings are the most popular, particularly for women. And so, you know, my advice, if you're unless you're very, very sure what the other person wants, I would uh, suggest going for a non-touch verbal greeting. And if you want, there's a lot more data. We have a website, wfhresearch.com, with a lot of data, media, various other stuff from working from home. And I'll stop that. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. I mean, uh, I realized that I started to categorize people at uh, this conference uh, between those who give the, you know, the bump with the, with the fist and those who are uh, you know, using the elbow. I mean, it's uh, pretty, pretty much like half-half of those who I met today. It's quite interesting. No, lots of uh, things uh, really to reflect upon. And now let's, let's move to, to Mike, both to you, really. Um, given your background and experience, you are possibly best place to tell us about uh, the employer's uh, role. Uh, do you, what will the business, the, the private sector, but also the, the public sector, if you want, will do? And, and in particular, do you think that employers will be able to, to address uh, some of the emerging issues, so some of, of uh, which, for example, uh, Nick has, has mentioned during uh, his presentation, to make you know, the workplace fairer, uh, to address the issues that are emerging? Mike. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And I was just trying to imagine the Babylonians and the Assyrians coming together and doing fist bumps and what that might have looked like uh, uh, several thousand years ago. Um, look, I think from the employer's perspective, the, 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 what COVID has underscored first and foremost is a new focus on workers' well-being and safety. And um, it's really brought to the fore both the concern about physical safety, but also very much the concern about mental health and how one's work-life balance is affected by the, the, changing, uh, the changing environment. Um, we've worked our way through COVID, we're continuing to work our way through COVID. And uh, to Nick's point, looking for ways to balance where technology and human interaction can best settle in a way that works for the individual and works for uh, for the uh, for the employer, I think it is important to note, as Nick did, that not everybody had the luxury during COVID of going online or working from home. And whether it was uh, essential workers, low wage workers, uh, small businesses that needed to maintain brick and mortar locations, and and while they many of them moved to a digital environment and e-commerce, there was still the issue of whether your restaurants or otherwise to be able to need to have to be there. Uh, in person, and then in many places, including in the United States, uh, not universal internet connectivity. And so you had you know, the pictures of uh, even students sitting outside public libraries to take advantage of Wi-Fi. You, know, you had a lot of employees who didn't have access to sufficient broadband uh, connectivity to be able to do their jobs uh, from home. Um, as we think about that in the hybrid world coming out of COVID, how do we ensure that there is sufficient connectivity, that there is sufficient infrastructure, uh, that there's a level playing field for that kind of access and a level playing field, as Nick pointed out, for the kind of interaction that is important for uh, recruitment, for uh, promotions, for culture building, for leadership development. Those are all front of mind, I think, in the minds of uh, of employers. So let me talk a little bit about what MasterCard did and then a little bit about the broader questions that we're looking at from the Center for Inclusive Growth. 
from the MasterCard point of view, the, the watchwords are really around flexibility, adaptability, and, and inclusivity. And the humility to understand that we didn't really understand how this pandemic was going to play out and that uh, we we're going to need to learn month by month as the pandemic evolved uh, what the human resources policies would have to be. We wanted first and foremost to convey to employees the safety and security of their jobs and our commitment to their safety and that of their families. So the first thing we did was commit to people that there'd be no COVID-related layoffs uh, during 2020 so that they didn't have to worry about their jobs. And we had the luxury of doing that. Obviously, a lot of companies and small businesses uh, couldn't make that kind of um, that kind of commitment. But as COVID lingered on, uh, issues around burnout and fatigue, uh, uh, Zoom fatigue and the like, uh, became also quite important. And it led us to a series of innovations around uh, flexible Fridays and, and, or the right day in the right geography, um, uh, meeting free days, uh, you know, people just appreciating not having any meetings so that they could clear their head, do planning, do thinking that is hard to do when you're back to back uh, in Zoom meetings. We just announced uh, today, actually, that uh, going forward, we're, even as we move towards, as uh, consistent with Nick's survey, a two to three day a week in the office kind of hybrid arrangement, that people will have four weeks to work from anywhere they want to work in the world. And so what they did during COVID to be with families or sometimes with their parents uh, or to go to some location that they could uh, create a better work-life balance, that that will be possible even after um, even after COVID. I think, you know, on one hand, we uh, we used our technology and our technology hubs to explore what could be done with technology to facilitate collaboration. But we also came to the realization, again, consistent with the survey data, that face-to-face -face interaction is critical to collaboration. And it's that informal engagement that oftentimes spur sparks the most innovative and uh, creative ideas. And Hence, like many other companies, we're heading towards that world of coming back two or three days a week, coming back in groups. Um, we're not doing the, the, the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday arrangement, but really leaving it to managers to organize when people need to come back with their colleagues to have those kinds of collaborative, uh, um, collaborative experiences. And then we've used this as an opportunity to, to use AI and create an internal marketplace for people who want to stretch and to take on additional assignments, sometimes uh, in areas around purpose-driven uh, purpose driven activity that, uh, that they can grow in the job and can connect them with other opportunities around the world that they might not otherwise, uh, but they might not otherwise have. I think looking more broadly outside of, 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 of one company, um, I, I think what's been underscored by this experience is that um, whether it's the digital inclusivity, making sure that that small, medium-sized businesses are connected to the digital economy so they can survive these kinds of uh, interruptions, because this may not be the last pandemic that, that we see, um, or making sure that workers have what they need for financial security, that they have uh, the confidence that they're going to have the necessary support for their jobs and, and in the financial sector. You know, what we've seen in many respects is the, the the trend towards uh, more gig workers uh, that existed pre-COVID have has been uh, accelerated, and that has raised real questions about where is the social safety net? Where do workers get benefits from if they're stitching together two or three part-time jobs uh, in the digital economy, and yet none of them offer the kind of benefits? And we've been working very closely with Bruegel, Mario, and others to look at the evolution of the labor market in uh, in Europe and how to make sure we're protecting vulnerable and, and marginalized um, populations, whether it's through um, uh, work to like uh, with uh, uh, places like RSA and Bayes Impact, which are bring technology to the table to help workers manage their financial stability um, to Things in the United States are looking at how to redefine the social safety net, the, the benefits, making sure benefits are are portable, are people centric, are interoperable, and are inclusive of all types of workers. Uh, that that uh, one thing that I think COVID and 
has led to is this uh, notion that you may work quite differently in the future than you have in the past, and your relationship to your employer may be quite different than what it has been in the past. We need to make sure that the benefits go along with the worker, however they decide to work, and that they have the necessary financial security to support themselves um, and their family. And not surprisingly, we're, we are strong proponents of, of, of how to use digital technology to help provide that kind of financial security. And we've seen, for example, with garment workers in, in Asia and elsewhere, when you begin to digitize wages and you begin to provide workers with the education about how to use digital tools and, and financial security, they, they, you see a significant increase in savings and financial security for uh, able to, to be able to deal with financial uh, emergencies. And that's been an area of focus of, of ours as well. So uh, bottom line, as, as we look to other companies and ourselves, I think we're coming out with um, uh, a whole series of new programs that recognize the, the, the changing impact on workers of this hybrid system going forward, making sure they've got the, the support in place from an infrastructure point of view, from a financial security point of view, and from a mental health point of view, to be able to chart a, a career that, um, that, that creates stability for them and for their families. And, and with Bruegel, we've been very pleased to partner with them on the research that is necessary, not just to contribute to, to the academic discussion, but also to translate that research into, into actionable insights that can inform policy discussions uh, in Europe and around the world. Thank, thank you very much, Mike. I mean, uh, for uh, all these uh, insights and uh, and also for uh, you know uh, broadening up uh, the the lesson, in fact, that we are getting from the pandemic. And the pandemic has emphasized uh, the need to reflect uh, on uh, indeed of the role on the role of technology and how that impacts uh, you know most vulnerable uh, categories. And so, indeed, I mean, I could say broader, even broader. Uh, topic uh, than the one that we are focusing uh, specifically today. Um, but, I mean, let me move now to, uh, to um, uh, Luca. Uh, do you, I mean, uh, you know, uh, do you think from the workers' perspective that this, uh, you know, uh, revolution that we are kind of going through will bring more more benefits or, or more risks? Uh, do, who, who stands to gain and who stands to lose? according to you, for what you are seeing, and, and in case, I mean, what should we do in order to address those, uh, those risks? It's clear that there are both benefits and risks, and uh, our task, I mean, as uh, trade unions, as social partners, as companies, but also public actors, is to reduce and minimize the risks and try to uh, emphasize the benefits. Uh, I will start from one thing that Michael mentioned at the beginning of his uh, presentation, that is that the first worry of workers, especially for those that have worked online so far and have been teleworking for most of the time, is to be sure that when they come back to work, uh, even in an hybrid form or a mixed format, they can return their jobs. Because there is an high risk, especially for companies that have been under huge pressure, economic pressure because of the pandemic, that they can introduce these missiles or even just work time reductions. And, you know, this will affect, of course, the job security of people, including their salaries. So the first point for all the actors involved in this picture, in this transformation, is to make sure that we can really build a sustainable economic recovery that can really guarantee that all the jobs that were there before the pandemic can be retained. And all this, of course, has to do uh, with all the different recovery strategies that the European Union, but also other countries in the global arena are trying to make, uh, to put in place. And it's, it's not just about the jobs that were in telework and that will go back to an hybrid format. It's also about uh, all surrounds uh, uh, to some extent uh, these jobs because we cannot forget that if people don't come back full time to their workplaces, there are a lot of other services, private and public services, that will be affected negatively in economic terms. Just if you think, I mean, to the Eureka se sector, the transports, uh, and any other type of services that are connected uh, to the workplace and provide services to the workplace. So all this has to be taken into account when we imagine macro strategies 
policies uh, for the return to work, uh, and it's absolutely important to have the right policies in place. Then coming to the core uh, discussion, the core of the discussion, that is, of course, the return to work and how to do it. Well, uh, as we have seen also from the polls, there are very mixed opinions uh, among workers, employees, but professionals, whoever, I mean, regarding what they really expect or would like to or would prefer, I mean, in terms of uh, coming back to work, uh, partially teleworking, fully teleworking, fully coming back to the workplace. Some people are just obliged to be fully, fully in the workplace. Others uh, have a choice. So, it's clear that people uh, take into account pro and cons from their point of view. And in this respect, what uh, Nick emphasized at the beginning is, of course, true. Quite environment, flexibility, opportunities also for better work-life balance uh, are fundamental elements in favor of teleworking. But at the same time, we cannot disregard the fact that teleworking can lead to isolation, to family problems sometimes, to difficulties in work-life conciliation, especially if uh, uh, public services and social services are not uh, available in uh, sufficiently, uh, but also, as it was mentioned before, mental health problems, uh, uh, potentially unlimited prolongation of working time without any control, uh, no interaction with colleagues, uh, drop in efficiency. So there are many things to be considered and to be balanced in this respect. That's why we need to carefully to make a careful assessment of uh, how we uh, return to work. We have to make sure that we have a good balance between workplace and telework. Mixed solutions uh, are to be privileged in this sense. Uh, we have seen that most of the people who would like to have two days teleworking and three days uh, uh, in the workplace. But of course, there are differences depending on the type of work you have to perform. And so these differences need capacity for adaptation. And we have also to take into account that indeed one thing is to have an hybrid conference like the one we are performing now. Another thing is to have delicate and tricky hybrid meetings. Nick's, uh, Nick was describing very well the risk of exclusion for some that cannot participate in the meetings uh, uh, in person. So all these elements have to be taken into account to avoid potential discrimination between those that can work online and those that cannot, but also among those that can telework. Uh, of course, we have to take into account that there are categories, groups uh, that could be discriminated or left behind that have to be protected uh, uh, properly. And another, other two elements that have could be, to be considered in the process is one, that uh, we need to give workers a choice. Of course, in the limits that are set by the work organization of each company, but as much as possible, the people should be able to make a choice uh, if they want to partially telework, telework fully or not. And then the other element is that uh, there cannot be a work organization just imposed uh, uh, top-down to employees without dialogue, social dialogue, collective bargaining, negotiations with workers' representatives and trade unions is absolutely essential to make sure that we can strike the best uh, uh, balance as possible. In this respect, we as the trade unions are already exploring all the elements that should be part of proper negotiations to rule uh, the teleworking settlement in the different companies, uh, taking into account different elements, as I said before, potential working time discrimination, unlimited working time ex extension that should be prevented, uh, the need to recognize and to uh, 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 support the right to disconnect, uh, uh, avoid wage discrimination that can happen and also reduction in salary benefits for those that telework because it's more difficult to measure, let's say, their performance at work. The need to, to avoid or to limit or to rule, let's say, remote control and to make sure that we can ensure full data protection for those that work uh, online. Make sure that we can uh, uh, th that we can provide full health and safety protection, but also uh, uh, the appropriate equipment at home to be able to telework uh, without uh, the burden goes just on the shoulders of the workers. Uh, we need to make sure that the opportunities for education and training are the same for those that telework and those that work in the workplace. Uh, we have to avoid damages to career and promotions, of course, as it was mentioned, and we have uh, to fill potential lacks in public services that are essential to support uh, those that telework as those uh, that go back to work. Uh, and uh, 
uh, as Marco uh, Mario was saying at the beginning, we have some uh, legal frameworks uh, that can support indeed these new types of negotiations that have to be developed uh, to make sure that we can protect uh, people and uh, increase the efficiency of the companies. Uh, we have a very old uh, telework uh, agreement, uh, 2002. We have a more, much more recent digitalization agreement signed by the European Social Partners just one year and a half uh, ago. These instruments can be very useful, but of course they have to be adapted to the new circumstances. And by the way, the European Social Partners are already exploring new forms of negotiations to improve and adapt these agreements. Uh, there is also a problem in terms of increasing the level of uh, implementation of these agreements, uh, at least in the European Union member states, because the level of implementation has been so far very inhomogeneous, and this, of course, doesn't help. Uh, we have also the need to reflect on the European legislation. Of course, I bring here the European perspective because this is the one that I know the best, but I know that there are also reflections going on in the ILO uh, context. When it comes to European legislation, and on this, uh, Sarah can for sure bring some elements for reflection. There is, uh, at the moment, a strong push coming from the European Parliament for the European Commission to legislate uh, on the right to disconnect. We have... Uh, met, unfortunately, some resistance uh, from the employer side for the moment, but this is something that we need to discuss. Uh, of course, uh, there is also new legislation coming for platform work, for health and safety when it comes uh, uh, to telework. Uh, so there is really uh, a lot to, to do also in terms of the legal framework uh, to make sure that we can adapt uh, uh, the laws and the pieces of legislation that we have, but at the same time also the agreements between social partners that can be very useful in framing of all this. And finally, last but not least, it's also very important that uh, the digital dimension, but also the teleworking dimension is included in the different plans that are part of next generation EU, so the recovery plans of the European Union, also at the national level in the digital act of the European Union, the social dimension, the uh, workers' dimension has to be considered also in that, uh, in that uh, context. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, we are really ready as social partners at the European level to bring a contribution, a positive contribution to this discussion, uh, and we are sure that all the actors will be really committed to make the best out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luca. I mean, a very, very, uh, lot of things uh, you mentioned, but I mean, I if I had to summarize it, basically what you're saying is that we need to give workers a real choice. Huh? What you, I mean, like you said, really, I mean, what that means, it means that those who choose to telework, I mean, like they need to be protected somehow. I need to be sure that, uh, but can I, can I ask you just quickly, I mean, like, a, 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 you know, a, explicitly, I mean, so would you be willing now, tomorrow, I mean, to sit down at the table and, uh, you know, rediscuss with the other social uh, partners, the telework uh, agreement from 2002. I mean, you, you mentioned it, but I would like absolutely. to hear it like, you know. No, yeah, no, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I can also confirm to you that uh, we are already doing so, uh, in the sense that the social partners have already started since a couple of months uh, to discuss the work program for the next years. And uh, this negotiation on revising the telework agreement is the first point in this discussion. So uh, we have already started sitting Fantastic. down together and reflecting on what we can do uh, okay. in this respect. And we need, of course, also the support of the legislator and of the European Commission. Great. Thank you very, thank you very much. I mean, this is, a, sorry, there is a little bit of noise here, um, but thank you. Uh, so, our last, of course, not the least uh, speaker, uh, Sara. Um, after all that we heard, uh, a perspective from a policymaker, um, do you think that, you know, there is scope for policy intervention in this area? Uh, or do you think that markets can actually adjust by themselves? I mean, do you trust uh, that? And what is the role of the European Union uh, in your view? Yeah, well, um, I think it's a very important question. Uh, and indeed, I think for, for, for me to answer that question, it's also really important to define what we're actually talking about. Um, because often when we're talking about uh, telework, uh, it gets mixed up, for instance, with remote work, which is not the same thing. Uh, we need to take that into account. Of course, telework is always going to be remote, but not all remote work is telework. 
And indeed, uh, like some of the speakers have already said, uh, there are some really important discussions there, for instance, when it comes to the gig economy, platform work, uh, etc. But that's, I think, such a broad topic, uh, we probably won't uh, get into that uh, in this discussion. I will really focus on, on telework because really, We've seen this big increase, as been said, uh, during the pandemic. I think that we've learned uh, a couple of things uh, from it. And what I would want to focus on, and, and Luca has already mentioned it, is really the right not to work when you're teleworking, so the right to disconnect. And of course, this also is linked to the fact that I think that you need bold legislation. Uh, I don't think that labor markets are just going to regulate themselves, and I think it's important uh, to have a strong legal framework uh, to protect both the employer and the employee. Um, so that affects actually a lot of people, and of course it depends in wh which sector uh, you're working, and this has been mentioned, but actually, well, it comes about millions of workers in, in Europe, uh, around 40% even, uh, when we look at the figures that uh, Eurofound um, has come up with. But yeah, we've seen this increase. Before the outbreak, it was maybe 15% of the workforce that had been teleworking. And then now these figures are, of course, much higher. Depends on, on the individual countries. Some in Finland, it's even 60%. Um, but in Belgium, for instance, speaking from my own experience, um, we've had quite uh, big numbers uh, here, and that's also, I think, one of the reasons why, for instance, Belgium has some legislation already in place when it comes to, uh, to that. And of course, there's a lot of pros and cons uh, when it comes to telework. Um, I think some of them have already been mentioned. I think, um, yeah, in the context of the pandemic, of course, it's been crucial uh, to have that job security, to tackle the health crisis. Of course, there's a lot more flexibility, for, in, for instance, when you're talking about working partners uh, that can continue to go to work even, you know, when you have to pick up your children from school or, well, when they're even not able to go to school, as, as was the case during uh, the pandemic. Um, but of course, I think there's also opportunities when it comes to an inclusive labor market. And well, one of the speakers already said, for instance, people with a disability might be more inclined uh, to, uh, to choose from, uh, for telework. Um, but yeah, there's also people combining different jobs, etc. So that makes it uh, more inclusive. It can increase productivity, as we've seen in, uh, in some studies. I think it's also important because, well, it does have an impact on our mobility. Uh, it has an impact on our climate. You won't be surprised that I would be saying that as a, as a green politician. Um, so that's all really good. Uh, but then these are potential uh, positive uh, things that com could come out of it. It's not automatic. And there are some disadvantages. Um, and indeed, in particularly uh, individual workers, you will see that sometimes it comes at a price. And this comes, of course, also coming from the fact that you get a blurred line between what your work life and your private life is. Um, you see there's surveys that say, well, 27% of respondents actually working from home say that, well, they've worked in their free time. Um, and uh, this is, these blurred lines, well, it, it can cause more stress, it can cause burnouts, uh, it can cause the, the difficulty for people to disconnect from their work. Um, and this always on culture can be uh, problematic. And that's, of course, why, indeed, from the European Parliament, we've said uh, there needs to be a right to disconnect from work, um, because otherwise we're going to lose those benefits that we can actually gain by uh, telework. And so, yeah, I don't think markets will magically uh, regulate themselves. I don't think that if we look at history, this has actually ever happened. <laughs> I think that we need, uh, well, we need the, the labor organizations, we need workers uh, to stand up for, uh, for, uh, for themselves. And we also need rules coming from the employer side, of course, uh, to make sure that both uh, parties really know what they're getting into, that rules are clear, what is being expected, uh, etc. So 
I think we need a regulation. There have already been some national regulations, like I said, but from the European context, uh, this is lacking. Indeed, uh, I think we need to, um, well, ramp up or look again at this framework uh, because it's quite old and, well, things evolve at, at, at a really uh, rapid speed. Um, there's some other um, framework legislation that we should take into account, for instance, directives on working time, work-life balance, uh, etc. And indeed, we did this report in January uh, on the right to disconnect, um, where I was negotiating for the Greens as a shadow rapporteur. And well, in this report, we really said, there are some minimum requirements that you need for using digital tools uh, outside the working time. You need to have this, this right to switch off, um, to refrain really from all of your working uh, related tasks, uh, your activities, your communication. Um, we need to safeguard workers also against negative repercussions. For instance, some of the speakers have already said it, Maybe um, when it comes to promotions, maybe when it comes to how much you're paid for the amount of work uh, that you're doing, etc. But indeed, and, and Luca already mentioned it, we are getting a bit of backlash uh, when it comes to um, some of the workers' organizations, which is uh, unfortunate, and that has delayed uh, this whole process. But still, um, I think that the Commission really uh, should take action. There's nothing to prevent them from doing it. It's not because the Parliament said, you know what, take your time and let's see what happens with the European framework on, uh, on digitalization, that they actually have to do that. So I would think that in a fast developing labor market, uh, it's really eminent and, and important uh, to have this uh, sort of framework. But I'm quite optimistic there uh, in the sense that we know that uh, Commissioner Schmidt, for instance, is interested in this legislation. And we've already seen that the Slovenian presidency also wants to work on that. So I would say, well, telework, there's really a lot of advantages. There are also a lot of disadvantages. We need to be able to measure those two up against each other, so you need a strong uh, regulator um, to, to be able to do that. And well, from where I'm standing, what I'm focusing on is really this right to disconnect, and I really hope in the next couple of months uh, we'll be able to take uh, further steps towards that, because I think that's really what is needed, both for workers and uh, for, uh, for the employers' organizations to prevent stress, burnout, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so, I mean, that means you, know, you are ready to you know, be proactively involved into this discussion and you see a, a role for public intervention and that's a, that's a very interesting uh, takeaway. Um, so, we, we now have like uh, approximately, I would say, 15 minutes uh, 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 to, to have uh, you know, some discussion. Um, let me, I mean, I will give you the opportunity. It's, of course, also learning by doing from my side. I mean, it's the first time that I'm having like a hybrid uh, conference. <laughs> so, and it's, it's a bit difficult to facilitate the, the interaction between you. But let me just uh, throw three questions uh, and then you choose what you, what you want to do, whether you address those questions or, or you want to react to what the other speakers have, uh, have said. So uh, two of them, they come from, uh, from Slido. Um, uh, one underlines the inequality aspect. So, I mean, uh, uh, first of all, of course, there is one which is extremely evident, which is the fact, as, as we, we mentioned, as also Nick mentioned and others, um, you know, basically those who can telework are somehow privileged. Eh? And so, I mean, like, will this revolution somehow exacerbate even more, in your view? the uh, inequality in that sense and, and what can we do about it. Uh, also, maybe the macro aspects to, on which uh, uh, Luca touched upon, you know, what is the implications, uh, for example, for the service sector or more geographic mobility uh, uh, by, uh, by workers. Um, related to that, the second question uh, concerns cross-border aspects, which are very, very relevant, of course, in the, in the European single market, but I mean, I guess they are very relevant also in the US. Uh, you know, what does that mean? What, what, do we need to, to think about the new, for example, taxation regimes uh, that allow more geographic mobility 
you know, to accommodate for, for, the new, for the new system? Or what, you, what are your thoughts around that? That's the second question. And the third question is mine. I uh, cannot resist. I really would like to, to understand how come that we needed a pandemic, in your view, to, uh, to get to, uh, to, to understand that we could telework. I mean, you know, in San Francisco, for example, you have extremely expensive uh, uh, offices. I mean, it's, uh, and you have uh, full, uh, you have companies, disruptors, uh, uh, you know, very successful disruptors that come with like amazing ideas that they have revolution, the economy, and they are, you know, they, it's a new paradigm. So, but still, they haven't thought before the pandemic that they could telework. I mean, does it question a little bit the rationality of, uh, <laughs> of uh, businesses? I mean, like, uh, that you need like a pandemic in order to, uh, to, to make such, such a move, to realize that you could do it. I mean, sounds a little bit weird for me. Anyway, so uh, do we want you to have another round? Uh, uh, maybe keep your intervention to max two minutes in order to have uh, you know, a discussion for everybody. Uh, Nick, you want to start? Sure. Um, I was just, I'm just going to comment on the inequality. I'm also going to take Sarah up on a point about protecting time. I have to leave on time, so I'm actually going to drive my daughter. Ah, sorry. To, yeah. No, no, to school. It's Cali I'm 7.45 in the morning in California. So on the inequality, I think it's a huge issue. Can I just show you one slide, then I'll say what I'm hearing from firms. So if I just show you one slide, just to show you this in data. So um, this is uh, annual earnings here on the x-axis and on the y-axis, there's two different things. One is how much people want to work from home post-COVID. These are uh, these black circles. We, we don't see the slide. Sorry, sorry, Nick, can we? Yeah. One second. Maybe we don't see that. I mean, you can go on. I mean, sorry, but uh, maybe we don't see it. Oh, can you not see it? Okay, I, mean, I can I stop. <laughs> okay, never mind. Why don't I just tell you in words in which case, which is um, if you look, everyone basically at whatever income level you, want, you have, wants to work two to two and a half days a week on average. So people earning $20,000 a year want to, earn, want to work about the same number of days per week at home as people earning $250,000 a year. If you ask individuals what they're going to get post-pandemic, that's completely different. So those at the bottom end of the income distribution, $20,000, I mean, it's very similar in euros, basically are not going to get to work from home. And those quarter of a million plus, probably like most people listening in terms of what they get, not in terms of income, are going to get to work from home two, two and a half, three days a week. So when I talk to companies, this comes up all the time. So the number of managers I've spoken to that said, my employees are really pissed off, or well, half of them are, because they've had to come in to the office throughout the pandemic, the low earning ones, some of them have got sick, one died. They're really angry now that the managers are getting to work from home and we're not. And it's hard, you know, the first point is to recognize it. The other solution I've heard from some firms is basically making a higher pay, offering a kind of bonus for those that do not get to work from home post-pandemic. So I've heard a few companies that are saying, if you're not going to get to work from home post-pandemic, you're going to get a 5% pay increase as a kind of make good. And in the survey data, it looks like people value hybrid work two days a week at about 7% of salary. So that's a pretty reasonable offering. You say you're not getting this perk that most people value, kind of 5 to 10% of salary, so instead we'll give you a 5% salary boost. I'll, I'll stop at that, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. And if you have to leave, please, I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, I could, you know, <laughs> to keep you, Mike. Mike. Maybe I'll comment on, on, on your last question, Mario, which is a, is, a great, uh, is a great question. In fact, if we think about, uh, had somebody said, everybody needs to stay off planes in order to deal with climate change, um, we would never have gotten the kind of collective action response that we did with COVID, but it's sort of been forced upon us from outside. And um, it's showed us what we can do collectively if there is the consensus and the will, and in this case, the fear uh, to, to, to do so. I think there's a competitive dynamic here right, that uh, that companies see, and and but it's shifting. And uh, these exogenous shocks, like a pandemic, that that bring first principles into question about: Do you need to have people in the office? Can you permit telework? Now, the the view is: Well, gee, I got to attract the, and retain the best quality employees I can, and they're demanding telework. And so, having once demanded to be there at the the headquarters of the tech firms, for example, uh, now they're demanding the kind of flexibility to allow them to work 
anywhere from around the country if they can uh, and still do that. And I think there'll be those competitive pressures ultimately that, uh, that, that force companies and employers to really respond to what the needs and the changing perspective of the needs are of their employee base. Coordination device. So the, the pandemic helped us to coordinate somehow. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, Luca. Well, I will start again uh, uh, as Michael from the last question. I think you are right. Uh, the, the pandemic forced us to telework. And the reason why we didn't do it before is that teleworking, managing teleworking is very difficult. For companies and workers, it's not easy, you know, to make sure that we don't introduce uh, uh, new inequalities on top of existing inequalities. To to avoid this, uh, you have really to find the right settlements and and rules. I mean, to uh, to avoid that these inequalities can really escalate. Uh, there are some geographical uh, taxation uh, legislative uh, obstacles uh, for, for instance, teleworking from abroad. Uh, you cannot do it uh, over a certain period of time in Europe because the legislation, the taxation legislation and other legislations uh, uh, forbid this uh, from happening. Your workplace is where you live. You cannot uh, work from another country, let's say. So there are things that have to be adjusted, I mean, to, uh, to make sure that we can really full enjoy uh, let's say, fully enjoy the, the, the potential, the positive potential of uh, teleworking. And again, as we said at the beginning, and this another part of your questions, uh, uh, there are some side effects, like the fact that, uh, yeah, if you don't go to the workplace, there are uh, entire ser uh, service sectors that uh, are at risk uh, of, uh, of uh, disappearing, I mean, or being significantly disrupted. So, I think, yeah, it's very difficult to manage it, uh, but it's a challenge we cannot avoid. So we need to find really the good ways, I mean, to address this phenomenon and to make, uh, to make the best use of it uh, as much as possible. Right, right. thank you. Thank you, Luca. Uh, Sara? Well, if you're asking why do we need a crisis uh, for this, I think it's often the case uh, that you sort of need a crisis to get further on uh, in, in, in policies, etc. I think telework is also a question of trust uh, between the employer and the employee. And of course, now we had to, uh, to do it. And well, during uh, this whole period, we sort of had to invent uh, um, a framework and a regulation for those places where it wasn't already, um, well, the, the common uh, thing to do. Uh, which makes it even more relevant, I think, to, to really develop that. But when it comes to inequality, I think it's a really important uh, issue that we need to, uh, to be aware of, that this is still just a part of, of the working core um, that we're really talking about. And we shouldn't forget, indeed, that there's a lot of workers that are actually not able uh, to do that because of the nature of, of their work. And there, I think it's very um, important that we also focus on safety at work, for instance, which of course, during the pandemic has been very crucial. Uh, we focus on working conditions. Um, and in that sense, well, there's um, a new uh, version of the health and safety at work uh, framework coming up uh, from the European level that I will be also following uh, that I think is going to be crucial uh, to make sure that also for the people that are working really on the work floor, uh, if you will, that they are protected, that they have fair and, and good working conditions and that, you know, they would actually want to uh, be there uh, amongst their colleagues uh, to, uh, to do those jobs, uh, well, if they're able to uh, telework or, or not. So, I think that is going to be um, next to the whole discussion about the right to disconnect and telework, one of those big things that we uh, as a parliament and that I as a politician am going to be focusing on the next couple of months. No, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, indeed. Um, I think this discussion will uh, keep on going for, uh, for quite, uh, quite a long time. And we are learning by doing, as all of you, I mean, somehow said it. I, I will close the panel here uh, because, I mean, uh, one thing that we learned during the pandemic is also to be quite disciplined <laughs> with, the, uh, with the meetings. And I know you have other engagements. So, but, uh, but first, let me really thank you because it was really a great discussion. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. 
and learn a lot of things, and I, I, I guess everybody who participated. And hopefully, I mean, I could, we'll uh, talk again about this topic uh, uh, in the future with you, uh, all of you. Um, let me also say that uh, uh, the, we will have a break now, and then afterwards at 5.30, we'll have uh, another very interesting panel on uh, uh, the Italian recovery and resilience uh, pl uh, plan. So, I mean, uh, please be here at uh, 5.30 CET. Uh, and, well, thank you very much. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be you know, the only one probably. I oh, know, you know, we have some audiences. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.